And hello, everybody. Good afternoon from a very, very, very cold Pittsburgh. And the snow is lying on the ground and it's not going anywhere because we haven't been above freezing all week. And wherever you are across the breadth of the continent or on any other continent, I hope you're well and I hope you're staying safe. And today we're going to talk, as you can see, flashing across the screen. Well, I wouldn't say flashing, but moving at a reasonable pace, the topsy-turvy world of words with connection to the dear beloved Oscar Wilde. Anyway, it's nice that you're all out there. I hope you're all out there. And do say hi. Robert, hello. Welcome back. 80 degrees. <sighs> you didn't have to say it. You didn't have to say it. You could have said, it's a trifle warm. Oh, hello, Shelley. Yes, it's cloudy and cold over here. Well, actually, it's not as cloudy here in uh, Regent Square, but it's still, it's still. Um... Hello, Grace in Dublin. Welcome back. Good to see you. So, uh, yeah, it's really chilly. And why is it we always talk about the weather as if it was new? I mean, Pittsburgh is... Like, Pittsburgh reminds me very much of Ireland. You know, the climate changes every two or three hours, but not this week. It's just snow and cold. Never mind. We have the spring to look forward to. Sure, if you have hot coffee and central heating, what more could you wish for? Yeah, you, Robert, I wish I were there too right now. Uh, I promise you. Hello, Anne. 25 degrees, but feels like 20. Yeah, it's annoying that, isn't it? I don't, if they just told you the temperature, but if they then told you how really cold you feel, it just sort of adds insult to injury, doesn't it? You know, feels like death is how I would put it. Cold, cold, cold. Well, who else is joining us? Mary Lou from Upper Sinclair. Upper Sinclair all sounds high. Of course it is, it's the South Hill, so it is high. So possibly colder because you probably get more of the Arctic blast that's coming at us. Julie, frigid Oakland. Yes, we're all feeling it, Julie. We're all feeling it. It's something that we all have in common at the moment. And even those of our friends in Europe are suffering from it too. Whereas the couple in Australia that we have now and then are just only getting midsummer rain. Hello, Helen. Oh, you sweetheart, you. You silver tongue thing. Thank you. Thank you, Jim. Yes, Burr. <laughs> Quite. When winter's here, can spring be far behind? Yes, it can. May is a long way away. Oh yes, it's Valentine's Day weekend. There's sort of a, something wrong about that, Valentine's Day weekend. The day can't last a weekend. The day is in a weekend. Well, anyway, it's Valentine's Day on Sunday. So if I don't see you, which I won't, happy Valentine's Day. I hope you hear from someone you love. I hope you tell someone you love them. That's terribly important. More important to tell someone than to be told by someone. And if you don't tell someone, you're unlikely to be told by someone. So get out there and tell someone you love them. Always good advice from Alan. <laughs> Surprise someone by telling them that you love them, because it could get you in terrible trouble. But it's worth a try. And then you might get a surprise. How are we doing? A couple of minutes and then we'll start. We'll let a few more people load up. And uh, hello, Christine. <laughs> it's 
Yes, I'm glad you found us. I'm glad you've been able to log into us. Welcome. And uh, and remember to tell all your friends that we're here every Friday at 2 o'clock uh, our time, 7 or 8 p.m. in the evening in Europe, depending on which part of Europe you're in. God knows what time of day it is in Australia. Uh, we did have somebody from India. I don't know if she's still with us, but um, if you're out there, we're still here. Um, I haven't heard from UK in uh, the Netherlands lately. Um, hello, Blythe. Yes, Wild is my favorite too. But anyway, do tell your friends. Um, the more that join us, the merrier we shall be. And also, remember, if you can't catch it on Friday at 2 or whatever time it is where you are, you can always catch it on our YouTube channel. Go to our website, take the link, and um, you'll see the webinars 2021, and you can see it there. And I think you can see it almost immediately after we finish doing the broadcast, or very, very shortly after that. Um, we used to, used to have to wait 12 hours, but now with this new wonderful um, setup we have, you get it almost instantly. And uh, if you uh, want to interest your friends, all the webinars from last year, from 2020, are up on there, or will be very soon. Uh, we're having to actually offload them from one platform to another. So if they're not all there yet, be patient. They will be very, very soon. Um, <laughs> Greg. The woods and churlish chiding of winter wind. I like that one, churlish chiding of winter wind. It makes the wind sound slightly annoying, which it is. Um, anyway, we're getting close to it. So I think we, we will make a start on the... Oh, wait a minute. Are you okay? You're here. You didn't drop out. I'm glad you're there. Nice to know you're still there. And hello, Dennis from Greensburg ever faithful, good chap. Um, so, uh, yes, ask the wild, the importance of being earnest. Now, there's a double meaning to that title today. It is, of course, the title of possibly the greatest comedy ever written, but I will have a further point to make about that particular title and the topsy-turvy world of words. I want to start with a quotation of Oscar. I have often found that alcohol, when consumed in sufficient quantities, produces all the effects of inebriation. Now, I'll come back to why I chose that one in a second, or it may become apparent. But the, the point I want to make about today, and forgive me if I, took, if I state the obvious a lot today, but it is slightly important because I have a fundamental belief that the style of comedic writing of Oscar Wilde is still evident today in so many modern comedians, so many modern comedic writers, so many playwrights of comedy. And it was a style he adopted and that he perfected quite remarkably. Uh, other writers of his, I mean, Shaw was writing all the way through, and Shaw maintained that he was the greatest writer since, and in fact, better than Shakespeare, um, and allegedly wrote comedies. And some of his plays are quite funny. Uh, but nobody perfected the art of comedy quite so perfectly as Oscar Wilde. And his uh, line of derivation, one might say, went back to Richard Brinsley Sheridan and the great uh, writers of the Restoration period. But also, he was so widely read um, that he absorbed influence from so many places. Uh, but I'm going to address quite early one of the most important influences in his life. Um, there's no question in my mind, and I am deeply prejudiced, and as I say, everything I tell you may be wrong, but everything I tell you about Oscar Wilde is deeply prejudiced by a particular passion I have for him. But there is no question in my mind that Oscar Wilde was a genius, a flawed genius, if ever there was one. Uh, and his particular genius was the use and the manipulation of language. Manipulation of language. 
it's no surprise or accident that he was described, and I think it was by Bosey Douglas, as the lord of language, and he knew it of himself. In uh, the letter De Profundis, which he wrote uh, from, from prison, uh, he wrote these words, the gods had given me almost everything. I had genius, a distinguished name, high social position, brilliancy, intellectual daring. He was never modest. I made art a philosophy and philosophy an art. I altered the minds of men and the colors of things. There was nothing I said or did that did not make people wonder. This is the important. I woke the imagination of my century so much that it created myth and legend around me. I summed up all systems in a phrase and all existence in an epigram. I became the spendthrift of my own genius and to waste an eternal youth gave me a curious joy. Look at the language in that. Look at the use of words and look at, at how, how he so perfectly um, sums up the particular skills, the particular language skills, the particular writing skills that he had. I summed up all existence in an epigram. This wonderful capacity to take an incredibly concept, uh, complex concept or a particular political philosophy or a social behavior or a religious belief and turn it into a simple, succinct and remarkably um, perfect piece of phraseology. So Oscar Fingal O'Flaherty Wills Wilde, to give him his full name, was, and uh, this is me now, I would consider one of the most imagin imaginative, inventive, creative, opinionated, self-satisfied, self-indulgent, self-pitying, and ultimately self-destructive artist that Ireland ever produced. And I mean that. And he was vain. You can read in his own words, you can tell from that previous quote that his vanity was extraordinary. Um, he even lied about his age. Uh, he always pretended to be a year younger than he was. Uh, and he wrote on that very topic. And as we come back to the epigrammatic form and, and how it works, um, no woman should ever be quite accurate about her age. It looks so calculating. Or uh, one should never trust a woman who tells one her real age. A woman who would tell one that would tell one anything. As I say, he had many faults, but vanity was probably his... Uh, it was the one that would lead to his downfall. It was his own belief in his own genius with words that ultimately in his final trial, in, 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 the, in the first trial, uh, the trial of Queensbury actually destroyed him. My life has been my art. I have been both the spectator of my own play, the actor and spectator of my own play. My days have been my sonnets, that same vanity of his capacity to be his own art and his own art was language. Now, where did the original source of that come from? I believe it was his mother who may have been the true source of his passion for words and with the passion for words, the art of conversation and turning that from the art of conversation, turning it to the art of drama. His mother, Jane F Francesca LG or Lady Wilde, uh, known by all as Speranza. She was a very famed and fabled hostess in Dublin. Um, she was a nationalist. She was an Irish nationalist. She was a very liberated woman long before women's liberation became a thing. Um, she uh, wrote some very remarkably indifferent revolutionary poems, but mostly she was a very modern woman. And Oscar adored her. As a child, worshipped her. Today, we might call her Bohemian. Oscar said to a friend, I want to introduce you to my mother. We have founded a society for the suppression of virtue. It's perfectly likely that in the, 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 uh, the renowned Oscar of later years learned his craft in the salon that his mother held in Merrion Square in Dublin. Merrion Square where the great and the good, the wise and the wicked, it was it was the 
the social and intellectual center of Dublin. And remember, Dublin had become a meritocracy. Most of the aristocrats had gone. And by the time that Oscar was young, it was about wealth and position and politics. Uh, but all of these great and good came to Lady Wilde's salon at the corner of Marion Square. If you're ever in Dublin, go to Marion Square, you'll see a statue of Oscar on one corner and opposite is number one, the house he lived in. And on the side of it, you see this sort of glass conservatory uh, uh, um, and it was in there that the salons were held. Um, but I, I, as I said, the great, the good, the intelligence of Dublin would gather and there would be conversation and they would be highly intelligent conversation, political conversation, social conversation, religious uh, conversation, scientific conversation, all of this happening in her salon. And she would gather them and she would be the hostess with the most as she could talk. And from her, I believe, came the embryo of his wit. An example, for instance, her line, and it sounds just like Oscar, but it's Speranza. A woman will flirt with anybody in the world as long as other people are looking on. Or this one. Plain women are always jealous of their husbands. Beautiful women never have the time. They're always so occupied being jealous of other women's husbands. Now that could be Oscar. It's not. It's his mother. So I do believe that his mother's use of words and, and capacity to construct an epigrammatic thought had a deep influence on him when he was a child. The influence that a woman would have on an impressionable boy who loves his mother. And Oscar tended much more to his mother's calling as an artist rather than that of his father as a scientist. He was His father was a um, ophthalmologist. Uh, he, he, he was... Uh, he was the eye surgeon to the queen when she was in Ireland, which was rare enough. Um, through his youth and his college years, he devoted himself to art, to literature, to Greek culture. His mother had a passion for all things that were Greek, and so did Oscar. She said, to be really medieval, one should have no body. To be really modern, one should have no soul. To be really Greek, one should have no clothes. He observed, uh, we Irish, speaking of, of language and, and words and the capacity to talk, we Irish are too practical to be poets. We are a nation of brilliant failures, but we are the greatest talkers since the Greeks. I don't know where he got that idea. So his first obsession, his primary obsession in life appears to be language. He adored words, lived for them, and especially his own. Now, one of his very early biographers was a man called Robert Sherrod, and he, he wrote in the biography what, about watching Oscar speaking, what, watching Oscar telling something, saying something. And it's very important about what happens in the course of this, this little report. i read it. The he that he refers to is Oscar Wilde. Caught by the beauty of his own words, his beautiful voice trembled with emotion, his eyes swam with tears, and then suddenly, by a swift, indescribably brilliant, whimsical touch, a swallowing flash on the waters of eloquence, the tone changed and rippled with laughter, bringing with it his audience relieved, delighted, and bubbling with uncontrollable merriment. Now, if you look at, apart from the rather purple prose than it's written in, if you look at what he's talking about, he is saying Oscar had the capacity to begin sentimentally or emotionally and before he had even finished speaking he had turned it into laughter and that is a really important um reference point the capacity to start a thought in one direction and then to turn it and twist it into another or as i will say uh, show you nauseatingly repeatedly in a moment to start with a, a, a proposition and pull the rug out from under it. Words were the blood that filled Oscar's veins. And he had a truly remarkable gift. His epigrams, he said, to sum up all existence in an epigram, and his epigrams became so famous. Uh, and, and within that, nothing, nothing, nothing was sacred. Nothing. You, know, it's a bit, <laughs> you might describe him as the family guy of the Victorian period. There are no topics upon which he would not comment. Uh, 
the only way to behave to a woman is to make love to her if she is pretty and to someone else if she is plain. On men, uh, men become old, but they never become good. On religion, when the gods wish to punish us, they answer our prayers. On labor, work is the curse of the drinking classes. On nature, if nature had been comfortable, mankind would never have invented architecture. I like that one, it's very true. Nature is very nice to look at, but do you want to live in it? Reminds me also, I think, of Coco Chanel's famous comment, green is the color of mother nature, and as far as I'm concerned, she can keep it. Now that's Coco Chanel doing an Oscarism. On Charles Dickens, who he hated, one must have a heart of stone to read of the death of little Nell without laughing. On good people, wickedness is a myth invented by good people to account for the curious attractiveness of others. On marriage, if I ever marry, I shall certainly try to forget the fact. Oh. On family, a family is a terrible encumbrance especially when one is not married. On debt, it is only by not paying bills that one can hope to live in the memory of the commercial classes. I love this next one because it's so true. To make, it's about cooking and diplomacy. To make a good salad, one has to be a brilliant diplomatist. The problem is exactly the same in both cases. To know exactly how much oil must be put with one's vinegar. Such a brilliant observation. He also had a comment on morality. When we are happy, we are always good. But when we are good, we are not always happy. And that truth is really, is pure, seldom pure, but uh, never simple. And on himself, and I think this, I'm always being asked, what's your favorite quote of Oscar Wilde? It is this, I am a man of simple tastes. I am easily satisfied with the best. There is a famous story that he was in the Cafe Royal and uh, at, at lunch and some day some, some wag said, uh, Oscar, is it true you can make a pun on any subject or an epigram on any subject? And Oscar replied, yes, of course I can. And the man immediately said, the Queen, to which Oscar immediately responded, the Queen is not a subject. His ability with language went much more further than uh, just the creation of perfect epigrams. He, the, um, the then young Irish poet, W.B. Yeats, after lunch with Oscar, he was invited to, a, to Oscar's house in Chelsea for lunch and uh, was asked, what was it like? What was it like? Because by this stage, Oscar was notorious and famous. And uh, Yeats commented on the fact, well, it was amazing. The dining room was all white. Everything was white. The walls, the ceiling, the floor. Uh, the, the floor, the boards of the floor were painted white. The table was white. The cloth was white. All, all the dishes and things, everything was white. Um, and what was he like? Oh, and this is the one. Uh, Yeats commented that he was the only man he had ever met who could converse in perfectly constructed sentences. You try it. I can't do it. But Oscar could. Oscar could immediately be constructing as he was speaking to ensure that everything he said was a sentence complete within itself. I had to think to do that. And speaking of dinner, by the way, Oscar uh, actually did want to steal from Shakespeare. I have been the course, the main course, at many London dinner parties. I am a man more dined against than dining. Now, there are thousands more examples. But where did the, this undoubted skill lie? It was more than a gift. It was a very understanding of how language worked. And just as around the, in around the same period, W.S. Gilbert would create this topsy-turvy world uh, up w w within his operettas by upending accepted social behavior and made use of the structures of farce. Oscar achieved his success by the use and misuse of language, the topsy-turvy misuse of language. But it was a misuse that was perfectly constructed. In other words, the correct use of language to create a misuse. 
Um, the topic of, of this is the point, the, the, the topic of the misuse of language was something upon which he was an absolute expert. You must remember, Oscar spoke not only perfect English, but also ancient Greek, Latin, and French, all fluently. Words were his plaything, they were his toy. Words, the whole, the whole lexicon that was available in all of those languages were just like a set of Lego to him, and he trod carefully upon them. So the structure of words would then become the next step in the game. He understood the importance of being precise. The precise construction of an idea or a proposition only to undermine it with the unexpected, such as starting with a proposition about drinking a lot of alcohol produces all the effect and you're waiting of for insanity, delusion, something terrible, produces all the effect of inebriation, using this twist at the end of a well-constructed thought to make it amusing. And he did that constantly. Uh, in his American notes, when he was, he did this major tour of America, quite amazing tour. Uh, and at one point he ended up in Leadville in Colorado. And he gave a lecture to a set, a group, big gang of miners. Here are miners, men working in metal. So I lectured them on the ethics of art. I read passages from the autobiography of Benvenuto Cellini, and they seemed much delighted. I was reproved by my hearers for not having brought him with me. I explained that he had been dead for some little time, which elicited the inquiry, who shot him? And there you have within that simple phrase, this proposition setting up a complex, perfectly structured proposition and undercutting it in an unexpected fashion. Afterwards, they took me to a dancing saloon where I saw the only rational method of art criticism that has ever come, I had ever come across. Over the piano was printed a notice. Please do not shoot the pianist, he's doing his best. Again, you've got that same notion, proposition, undercut it. Uh, I went to the theater to lecture and was informed that just before I arrived, two men had been seized for committing a murder. And in that very theater, they'd been brought on stage at eight o'clock in the evening and then and there tried for murder and executed before a crowded audience. It's the same principle over and over again, but executed with perfect precision. We've got three examples there of that, that precision of building a point only to un undermine it with the unexpected. He did it in some of his um, tiny stories. He wrote countless stories for his boys. We know of the great four fairy tales, but there were so many that he wrote. He would write these little, uh, write and rewrite these, these little bon mots, um, mostly for his boys, uh, but also for the sheer delight of them. I'll give you an example of one of them. And it is with um, great seriousness he writes of this once, while the devil was crossing the Libyan desert, he came to a place where a number of small fiends were tormenting a holy hermit with images of the seven deadly sins. The willpower of the sainted man was too strong for them, and he easily shook off their evil suggestions. Having watched the miserable failure of the demons, the devil stepped forward to give them a lesson. What you do is too crude. Permit me for one moment. And with that, he whispered to the holy man, your brother has just been made Bishop of Alexandria. At once, a scowl of malignant jealousy crowded the serene face of the hermit. That, explained the devil to his imps, is the sort of thing I should recommend. Now, again, you, it, it, it's a different format, it's a different layout, but it is exactly that same principle. And it, that that he kept exercising himself with to perfect this art of the proposition and the undercut.
And so, through that, and, and it's there in all of his plays, um, but it is best exemplified in, you know, possibly his greatest, if not the world's most perfect comedy that was ever created. And there's hardly a line in it that doesn't have some comedic structure. Now, in Bonds being earnest, most people know, and I'm not proposing to go through the whole play and tell you how funny it is. What I want to do is demonstrate what I mean, my, my, my thesis on this particular point. And some of these lines, and I think I mentioned this last week, some of these lines never get a laugh. They never get a laugh from the audience because they're too soon, too sudden. There's hardly a line in this play that doesn't have this potential for comedic structure within it. Right from the very start, we start by hearing a piano being played off stage and a butler coming in and setting up tea. And then Algernon, the pianist, comes in and says to his butler, did you hear what I was playing, Lane? To which uh, his butler replies, no, sir, I didn't think it polite to listen. Which is a perfect example of the fundamental scaffolding of the way this works. You set a proposition, did you hear what I was playing? To which you would expect it was delightful, sir, or whatever. No, sir, I didn't think it polite to listen. Which is, if you look at it, the perfect insult because it sounds like praise. In fact, Lane the butler should have been a critic. A moment later, another line that never gets a laugh and is a, just the simple construction, the use and understanding of words and how they work. When Algernon says, when it comes to the piano, sentiment is my forte. It never gets a laugh, but it used, it's a genius use of the double meaning of the word forte. Uh, and the word structure. And it's sort of priming the audience for what to expect. Throughout the play, we see, keep seeing this, this rug being pulled out from under the most precise and perfectly formed propositions. Uh, Algernon, again, talking about marriage, I really don't see anything romantic in proposing. It's very romantic to be in love, but there's nothing romantic about a definite proposal. Why one may be accepted. One usually is, I believe. And then the excitement is all over. The very essence of romance is uncertainty. If ever I get married, I'll certainly try to forget the fact. Again, you're, you're seeing over and over again, I'm going to keep going on and on about this, so if, I, if I'm boring you, I'm terribly sorry, but I love it. You look at the complexity of the language structure in this exchange, for instance, between Lady Bracknell and Algernon. This could almost be high drama, and that's the important thing about it the earnestness with which these words must be delivered. They must be delivered as totally and important, totally important, totally uh, sincere, deeply earnest. This could almost be Hibson. And she's talking about Algernon's strange and imaginary friend, Mr. Bunbury. It is very strange this Mr. Bunbury seems to suffer from curiously bad health. Well, I must say, Algernon, I think it's high time that Mr. Bunbury made up his mind whether he was going to live or to die. This shilly-shallying with the question is absurd. Nor do I in any way approve of the modern sympathy with invalids. I consider it morbid. Illness of any kind is hardly a thing to be encouraged in others. Health is the primary duty of life. I'm always telling that to your poor uncle, but he never seems to take much notice as far as any improvement in his ailment goes. Well, Algernon, I'd be much obliged if you would ask Mr. Bunbury from me to be kind enough not to have a relapse on Saturday, for I rely on you to arrange my music for me. It is my last reception and one wants something that will encourage conversation, particularly at the end of the season, when everyone has practically said whatever they had to say, which in most cases was probably not much. Now, again, even within that simple speech, that proposition, rug pull, proposition, rug pull. Also, notice that lesser writers would not have managed to get practically and probably into the same sentence with such superb efficiency. Algernon takes up the tone. I'll speak to Bunbury Aunt Augusta if he's still conscious, and I think I can promise you he'll be all right by Saturday. Of course, the music is a great difficulty. You see, one, if one plays good music, 
people don't listen. And if one plays bad music, people don't talk. Oh, it's very thoughtful of you, Algernon. I'm sure the program will be delightful. After a few expurgations, French songs, I cannot possibly permit. People always seem to think that they are improper and either look shocked, which is vulgar, or laugh, which is worse. But German sounds a thoroughly respectable language. So you, you see it again. Proposition undercut, proposition undercut. Take another look. Gwendolyn, the divine Gwendolyn, the wonderful Gwendolyn, the Gwendolyn with whom John Worthing is so totally, extremely, um, passionately in love. Unfortunately, John Worthing doesn't have a rom romantic bone in his body. His proposal to her demonstrates that. It is Oscar writing inadequacy of language at its best. Miss Fairfax, ever since I met you, I have admired you more than any girl I have ever met since I met you. Gwendolyn is not romantic. Gwendolyn is practical, but Gwendolyn uses romance as a weapon. It is, a, she has this remarkable, rather like her mother, capacity for using language to demonstrate that which she may not necessarily feel, but is determined that others may be certain that she does feel it. I'm quite well aware of the fact, she responds, and I often wish in public, at any rate, you had been more demonstrative. For me, you have always had an irresistible fascination. Even before I met you, I was far from indifferent to you. We live, as I hope you know, Mr. Worthing, in an age of ideals. The fact is constantly mentioned in the more expensive monthly magazines and has now reached the provincial pulpits, I am told. And my ideal has always been to love someone of the name of Ernest. There is something in that name that inspires absolute confidence. The moment Algernon first mentioned to me that he had a friend called Ernest, I knew I was destined to love you. Now, apart from the utter absurdity of that, the ridiculousness of it, look at the construction of it. Look at how perfectly those words are balanced and maintained, how that theme is developed. It's almost, it's, it's remember back to Sherrod's description of Oscar talking himself that within all of these things, there is a lyricism, there is a magic, there's a music, and that music is always, just as you expect it to rise to its final heights, pulled from underneath you. Gwendolyn, says Jack, will you marry me? Of course I will, darling. How long you've been about it? I'm afraid you've had very little experience of how to propose. Men often propose for practice. I know my brother Gerald does. All my girlfriends tell me so. What wonderfully blue eyes you have, Ernest. They're quite, quite blue. I hope you will always look at me like that, especially when there are other people present. You've heard that theme before in, in some of his epigrams. Oscar never wasted a good idea by only using it three times. Let's look at this potentially tragic moment in the play when Canon Chasuble and Miss Prism greet Mr. Worthing and he is grieving over the loss of his imaginary brother. Dear Mr. Worthing, I trust this garb of woe does not betoken some terrible calamity. My brother, says Jack. More shameful debts and extravagance, says Miss Prism. Still leading his life of pressure, says Canon Jezebel. Dead, says Jack. Your brother Ern is dead. Quite dead. To which Miss Prism responds in this moment of grief. What a lesson for him. I trust he will profit by it. I know I'm repeating myself, but indulge me. The delight in this structure of language that is so perfectly balanced and terribly easy to learn if you're an actor because the rhythm is so absolutely beautiful. Precise proposition perfectly undercut there by Miss Prism's sense of Christian values. By the way, tiny note about the importance of being earnest. Canon Chasuble is always, it's a delightful part. It's one of the five parts I've played in the play. Uh, Oscar was lampooning at that point the entire Oxford movement. Um, the Oxford movement uh, was a shift in the Church of England back to what they called the primitive church. And Chasuble's always talking about it. And it, the result was that you had a group of highly, 
highly intellectual religious academics who took holy orders and were sent out to run parishes across the country with no idea of what being a parish priest actually meant. And uh, Karen Chasuble is a perfect example of it. And Oscar was using this little glorious opportunity to say Church of England is incompetent because it surrounds the or fills the country with religious incompetence. One of my favorite moments in this play with regard to this set up undercut, set up undercut, is the exchange between Cecily and Gwendolyn when Gwendolyn visits the country. And we've already established Gwendolyn as a highly uh, articulate and with, a, with the, the tongue of a viper when she wants it. And so we assume, and Oscar sets us up to assume, that she is going to defeat Cecily hands down. What she does not recognize, or does not expect, is that Cecily is just as clever as she is. And so you have this beautiful construct. And again, I'm not talking about plot, I'm not talking about comedy, I want to talk about construct, use of words, and the capacity, the topsy-turvy use of words to turn things on its head. When Gwendolyn arrives in the garden, Cecily comes forward and says, pray let me introduce myself to you. My name is Cecily Cardew. Cecily Cardew, says Gwendolyn. What a very sweet name. Something tells me we are going to be great friends. I like you already more than I can say. My first impressions of people are never wrong. Setting up a proposition. How nice of you to like me so much after we've known each other such a comparatively short time, about 30 seconds. Pray sit down, Gwendolyn. May I call you Cecily? I may call you Cecily, may I not? With pleasure, says Cecily. And you will always call me Gwendolyn, won't you? If you wish, then that is all quite settled, is it not? Note that, will you, is it not? Gwendolyn trying to take control of the situation. I hope so, says Cecily, sounding innocent. Perhaps, says Gwendolyn, it might be a favourable opportunity for my mentioning who I am. My father is Lord Bracknell. You have never heard of Papa, I suppose? Now, what you want to hear is, oh, yes. But what Cecily says is, I don't think so. Gwendolyn recovering instantly. Outside the family circle, Papa, I'm glad to say, is entirely unknown. Again, you see that. Set it up, pull it down, pull it back. And she gives a small homily on how husbands and men should behave. Once a man begins to ne neglect his domestic duties, he becomes painfully effeminate, does he not? And I don't like that. It makes men so very attractive. And then she makes a request. Mama, who is very strict in education, has brought me up to be extremely so short-sighted. It's part of her system. Do you mind if my looking at you through my glasses? Oh, not at all, says Cecily. Oh, no, not at all, Gwendolyn. I'm very fond of being looked at. So Gwendolyn looks at her through the lorgnette and doesn't like what she sees. You are here on a short visit, I suppose, Cecily. Oh, no, I live here. Gwendolyn, really? Your mother, no doubt, or some female relative advanced years resides here also. Oh, no, I have no mother, nor in fact any relations. Indeed. Here she is, come to visit her fiancé and finds a young woman who is very pretty, who has no parents, no senior relative living in his house. We're beginning to undercut what we've already set up. These two girls are now eternal friends. But Cecily goes on, my dear guardian, with the assistance of Miss Prism, has the arduous task of looking after me. Your guardian? Yes. I am Mr. Worthing's ward. Devastation for Gwendolyn. But she doesn't show it because what is important, and if you look at the construct again throughout this entire scene, they never are allowed to lose their temper. No matter what is said, it must be done in the best possible taste. And that is why the language is important. And it's important for the actor or the director or whoever when interpreting this for the stage, to recognize that at no point do tempers flare. Articulation 
perfectly constructed sentences, beautiful expressions are always used, but they are used and tempered because of his understanding of words in a brilliant way, a way that can demonstrate what is going on in there while what is going on out here is precise good manners. It is strange, says Gwendolyn. He never mentioned to me that he had a ward. How secretive of him. He glows, grows more interesting hourly. Secretive, interesting. It's a bit like the Chinese curse. May you live in interesting times. I'm not sure, however, that the news inspires me with feelings of unmixed delight. I'm very fond of you, Cecily. I have liked you ever since I met you five minutes ago. But I am bound to state that now that I know you are Mr. Worthing's ward, I cannot help being expressing, I cannot help expressing a wish that you are, well, just a little older than you seem to be, and not quite so very alluring in appearance. In fact, if I may speak candidly, look at that, the request. May I tell the truth? If I may speak candidly, Oh, pray do, says Cecily. I think that whenever one has anything unpleasant to say, one should always be quite candid. Well, says Gwendolyn, to speak with perfect candor, Cecily, I wish that you were fully 42 and more than unusually plain for your age. Ernest has an upright nature. He is the very soul of truth and honor. Disloyalty would be impossible to him as deception. But even men of the noblest possible moral character are extremely susceptible to the influence of the physical charms of others. Now look, look at that. What Gwendolyn is saying inside is, you bitch. <laughs> but the construct, the beautiful pattern of language. Now the problem starts. Cecily picks up on it. I beg your pardon, Gwendolyn, did you say Ernest? Yes, but it is not Mr. Ernest Worthing who is my guardian. It is his, it is his brother, his elder brother. Gwendolyn never mentioned, uh, it says, Ernest never mentioned that he, that he had a brother. Oh, I'm sorry to say they've not been on good terms for a long time. That accounts a Gwendolyn feeling. The pressure subsides, but to show that she is not concerned, Gwendolyn will give another homily. Now I think of it, I've never heard a man mention his brother. The subject seems distasteful to most men. Cecily, you have lifted a load from my mind. I was growing almost anxious. It would have been terrible if a cloud had come across a friendship like ours, would it not? Of course, you're quite sure it's not Mr. Ernest Worthing, who is your guardian. Quite sure, says Cecily. In fact, I'm going to be his. I beg your pardon. Note. The growing endearments, dear, darling, it gets more uh, precise. Politeness is everything when all is at stake. Cecily, dearest Gwendolyn, there is no reason why I should not make a secret of it to you. Our little county newspaper is sure to chronicle the fact next week. Mr. Irving, Ernest Worthing and I are engaged to be married. To which Gwendolyn responds, my darling Cecily, I think there must be some slight error. Mr. Ernest Worthing is engaged to me. The announcement will appear in the morning post on Saturday at the latest. Cecily, politely, I'm afraid you must be under some misconception. Ernest proposed to me at ex exactly 10 minutes ago and shows Gwendolyn her diary. Gwendolyn, it is certainly very curious, for he asked me to be his wife yesterday afternoon at 5.30. If you would care to verify the incident, pray do so. And she offers her own diary. I never travel without my diary. One should always have something sensational to read on the train. I'm so sorry, dear Cecily, if it is any disappointment to you, but I'm afraid I have the prior claim. Cecily. It would distress me more than I can tell you, dear Gwendolyn, if it caused you any mental or physical anguish. But I feel bound to point out that since Ernest proposed to you, he clearly changed his mind. Gwendolyn, and Oscar puts in a little stage direction here, meditatively. 
If the poor fellow has been entrapped into any foolish promise, I shall consider it my duty to rescue him at once and with a firm hand. Now notice there are insults beginning to materialize, entrapped, but it's done with such polite precision. Cecily, another stage direction, thoughtfully and sadly. Whatever unfortunate entanglement my dear boy may have got into, I will never reproach him with it after we are married. Now, this is the height of anger, and it is done with such sweetness of temper. Do you allude to me, Miss Cardew? And it's gone from Cecily to Miss Cardew as an entanglement. You are presumptuous on such an occasion. As this kind, it becomes more than a moral duty to speak one's mind. It becomes a pleasure. I'm going to be really happy insulting you. Cecily, do you suggest, Miss Fairfax, Gwendolyn gone now, Miss Fairfax, that I entrapped Ernest into an engagement? How dare you? This is no time for wearing the shallow mask of manners. When I see a spade, I call it a spade. Gwendolyn, I am glad to say that I have never seen a spade. It is obvious that our social spheres have been widely different. And in that beautiful moment, in that beautiful construct that has taken maybe five minutes of stage time, you have gone from the creation of a perfect sisterly friendship to an absolute and complete war of the roses. The girls now hate one another, but at no point have voices been raised. At no point has a true insult been called. The worst thing that has happened is that we have gone from Gwendolyn Miss Fairfax to, uh, so, sorry, Cecil, uh, Miss Cardew Miss Fairfax to Cecily Gwendolyn to Miss Cardew Miss Fairfax. And in that beautifully constructed curve, so many rugs have been pulled on, out from under these, these beautifully expressed propositions that the thing becomes a delight. You're not belly laughing, you're not rolling around in the aisles, but you are constantly smiling. You are Your expectations of what's going to come next, what's going to come next, and it's going to be confirmed. But it is done with an enormous degree of earnest delivery, that we are being truthful, that these characters are presenting these propositions as if their lives depended upon it. Oscar Wilde could do this almost constantly. He had this capacity, this deep, profound understanding of the way language worked. He could compose at will, if you like. He could grasp words out of the air and make music with them. And if you don't believe me, look at Mozart, who did exactly the same thing. To my mind, Oscar was the, the Mozart of, of, of the English language. Um, and he, as an example of that, when we came to the trials of Oscar Wilde, in the third trial, the one where he was finally convicted, um, he was asked um, about a particular poem and um, a character in the poem who describes himself in a particular way. And, and the, um, the lawyer asked him, what does this mean? What is the love that dare not speak his name? And this, Oscar replied, it was, he didn't expect it. He didn't know it was coming. But without batting an eyelid, he explained it like this, totally off the top of his head. The love that dare not speak its name in this century is such a great affection of an elder for a younger man as there was between David and Jonathan, such as Plato made the very basis of his philosophy and such as you find in the sonnets of Michelangelo and Shakespeare. It is that deep spiritual affection that is as pure as it is perfect. It dictates and pervades great works of art like those of Shakespeare and Michelangelo and those two letters of mine, such as they are. It is in this century misunderstood, so much misunderstood that it may be described as the love that dare not speak its name. And on account of this, I am placed where I am now. It is beautiful. It is fine. It is the noblest form of affection. There is nothing unnatural about it. It is intellectually intellectual, and it repeatedly exists between an elder and a younger man. And the elder man has intellect 
and the younger man has all the joy, hope, and glamour of life before him. That it should be so, the world does not understand. The world mocks at it and sometimes puts one in the pillory for it. That speech is often described as the great defense of his own homosexuality. What he was describing, what he was defending, was platonic love. And it's the most perfect description of it. And it was off the top of his head. It was an example of the mastery of the use of words. Words flooding around, as I said, he had a lexicon of, uh, uh, of a multitude of linguistic opportunity. His, his knowledge and his understanding of English was so precise and so perfect and of construct. This man who could converse in perfect sentences. He, words, if words were his work, if words were his lifeblood, uh, they were also the, his dream and his own act of redemption. And some of the most beautiful things he ever wrote, he wrote at the end of his life, the Ballad of Reading Jail being a case in point. It is written in strict ballad form and it is quite extraordinary. Um, and I recommend that you sit and read it. It's really well, well worth it. Um, and, and of course, the great prose poem, De Profundis, the letter that he wrote to Bosey Douglas from Reading Jail. Um, and in that, in a, in a way, I'm coming close to the end now, but in that he, he to an extent, um, he brings this topsy-turvy into play as he examines the absurdity of his own life. Uh, he sets out the perfect, precise explanation of what his expectation of life would be. And at the same time, shows the way life pulled that rug from underneath him. And it was a passage in, in De Profundis that I think explains that. The gods had given me almost everything. I had genius, a distinguished name, high social position, brilliancy, intellectual daring. You heard this at the beginning of the talk. I made art a philosophy and philosophy an art. I altered the minds of men and the colors of things. There was nothing I said or did that did not make people wonder. I woke the imagination of my century that it created myth and legend around me. I summed up all systems in a phrase, all existence in an epigram. I became the spendthrift of my own genius and to waste an eternal youth gave me joy. Now, as I say, we looked at that at the beginning of the webinar. There it is at the end, his absolute self-awareness of his own capacity to use words to change the world, to change the way people think, to change the way that he was a satirist, that he was a philosopher, that all of this summed up in the most exquisite expression of words. He went on to describe the rug being pulled by life. I wanted to eat of all the fruits of all the trees in the garden of the world. I was going out into the world with that passion in my soul. And so indeed I went out and so I lived. My only mistake was that I confined myself to the sun gilt side of the garden and shunned the other side for its shadows and its gloom. Failure, disgrace, poverty, despair, suffering, tears even, the broken words that come from the lips of pain, remorse that makes one walk in thorns, conscience that condemns, the misery that puts ashes on its head and into its own drink puts gall. All these were things of which I was afraid. And as I had determined to know nothing of them, I was forced to taste each one of them in turn, to feed on them, to have for a season no other food at all. I don't regret for a single moment having lived for pleasure. There was no pleasure I did not experience. I threw the pearl of my life into the cup of wine. I went down the primrose path to the sound of flutes. I lived on honeycomb, but I had to pass on. The other half of the garden had its secrets for me also. Now, you may say, okay, yeah, well, it's beautifully written, it's lovely, but what we've got to remember, he was sitting in a prison cell in Reading Jail. C33 was the number on the door. 
He was given a sheet of paper each day from the prison governor, and he could fill that sheet of paper with writing. At the end of the day, he had to give it back to the prison guard, and the next day he got another sheet of paper. He had no way of back-referencing what he was writing. And when you look at the manuscript, and you can see the manuscript in the British Museum, I'm not sure if you can see it, but it's there in the British Museum. There were very few corrections, very few. He wrote as he thought. I defy anyone to write that exquisitely without corrections, without a scribble or jotter pad beside you, to write those thoughts as succinctly and preci as precisely. It comes from a deep understanding within oneself of who you are and what you've been and what you've done. But not only that, a deep understanding of the use and structure of language that you can express it so perfectly once without corrections. A lord of language indeed. Interestingly, when he left prison, that gift of the undercut hadn't left him. Um, on the day that he left prison, he was collected. Um, in fact, he was transferred back to, to Pentonville, I think, um, to be released. And he was met by Robbie Ross and a couple of other friends. And they went to another friend's house where a gathering uh, was there. Just a small number of, of Oscar's um, uh, friends had gathered to, to give him breakfast. And in the company was uh, um, Ada Leveson, who uh, was a great friend of Oscar. Uh, he, that he adored her. He nicknamed her the Sphinx. And her husband described the meeting. He came in, said the husband, and at once put us at our ease. He came in with the dignity of a king returning from exile. He came in talking, laughing, smoking a cigarette with waved hair and a flower in his buttonhole. And his first words were, Sphinx, how marvelous, marvelous of you to know exactly the right hat to wear at seven o'clock in the morning to meet a friend who has been away. That's no different to the way he would write within the plays, within his essays, within his poetry, that same magnificent controlled use of language. And always the undercut. After leaving um, uh, London, uh, he went to live in the north of France, in Berneval, um, and constantly writing letters with these same epigrammatic moments of genius. I enjoy outdoor sports. I have often played dominoes outside French cafes. Um, finally, settling in Paris, still with nothing dying. I have no money at all. I live, or am supposed to live, on a few francs a day. Like dear little St. Francis of Assisi, I am wedded to poverty. But in my case, the marriage is not a success. All his writing, be it comedic or tragic, Oscar demonstrated that one should always write with precision and an eye to perfection. To gain the optimum effect, one must recognize if one is going to be amusing, if one is going to be able to undercut one's proposition, one must always recognize at all times the vital importance of being earnest. And that's today. So, I hope you bore with me. As you may recognize, I have a particular and overwhelming fashion for the, uh, for the works of Oscar Wilde, for the writings of Oscar Wilde. I've done more of his plays. I think I've directed and acted in his plays more than any other writer. Um, and I'll probably come back to Oscar again at a later point, because at some point, maybe later this year, I want to talk about him as an essayist, uh, Oscar the philosopher. And some of the essays, The Decay of Lying is uh, a totally wonderful um, a, piece of, a piece of work. And so I will be talking about Oscar again. Prepare yourselves, because I just never give up on him. Um, now, what's coming up soon? Uh, we've got a question. Was the gender crossing of roles part of the original production? No, it wasn't. Uh, <laughs> no. Um, 
the gender crossing, you're referring to the production that we did at Pipped. Um, what year was it? Uh, about 10 years ago, uh, which was a reproduction of the production we did at the Abbey Theatre in Dublin. And in fact, uh, we recreated the design and most of the costumes came from the Abbey Theatre in Dublin. Uh, we did this production as I insisted on describing it because they said, let's do an all male production. And I said, no, I said, we'll do a, a production with a cast composed entirely of gentlemen. But uh, that was purely, I think it was just because the director, because I'd done so much Oscar Wilde at the Gate Theatre, the director wanted me to go to the Abbey and play Lady Bracknell because um, so, the gate would never let me do that. So um, that was it. If so, was it part of the topsy-turviness of his language? Yes, um, because you will find that Lady Bracknell speaks with a very masculine voice and occasionally so does Gwendolyn. And if anybody knows who's going to wear the trousers in the family when Gwendolyn eventually marries her first cousin, John Worthing or Ernest, uh, it's going to be Gwendolyn. Um, where is the description of platonic love? The, uh, no, uh, it's actually in the trial. Um, and it, you'll find it referred to in Richard Elman's um, biography of Oscar and uh, jo, um, what was the name of the other one? Uh, the, the, Richard, the Richard Elman biography is the best. It has some errors in it, but generally speaking, it's the best and you'll find it there. Um, the um, uh, Merlin Holland's book, The, the uh, Purple Peacock and the Scar of Marquis, is only about the first trial, so it's not in there. So check out the Elman biography and you'll find it. Have I directed and acted Oscar Wilde's book? I think you mean more, Jen Dennis. Um, yeah, I'm not sure. I'm not sure. Uh, but I've done a lot. Um, I, I, I mean, I, I played Lord Illingworth in A Woman of No Importance. Um, I played um, uh, Sir Robert Chilton in an, uh, an Ideal Husband, and I've also directed it twice. Um, I have played, a, a long time ago, I played Toppy in, in Lady Windermere, and I've directed that three times. And uh, Ernest, I've directed it and directed it, and I've played in different productions. Algernon, Jack, Canon Chasuble, Lane, and Lady Bracknell. So yeah, I've done an awful lot of Oscar Wilde, but I also have a passion for it, and I've been I've read him and read him and read him all my time. Um, a webinar on De Profundis, yes, I would be very willing to do that. So there's two that we can list: one on the decay of lying, and one on De Profundis. Um, and if you have any other ideas of webinars you'd like. Let me know and I'll do my very best. And if I don't know anything about it, I'll find somebody that does. Um, just to let you next, for the next two weeks, we're going to have another two week session. We're going to be talking about um, another Irish writer. Um, and uh, I'm going to be joined uh, by um, that eminent um, Pittsburgh actress and teacher of, of theatre. Hazel Leroy, and we're going to be talking about uh, the fun-filled aspects of Samuel Beckett. Um, we're going to be talking about Gordo in week one and Endgame in week two. But the thing that I want we want to examine is the fact, you know, uh, Beckett wrote funny plays. And um, so we're going to be examining that, uh, you might say, the fun and frolics of uh, Gordo and Endgame. Uh, but that'll be for the next two weeks. And I do hope you join in on that. Um, if you love Beckett, join in. If you don't love Beckett, join in. And if you've never read Beckett, certainly join in. Spread the word for us. It really does help. As I say, if you're interested in sponsoring a webinar, please contact us, send us an email, and we'll get back to you straight away with the information. Um, if you don't want to sponsor, but you want to donate, Go to the website and you'll find the big red button um, to donate. Um, do please, uh, it really is important, especially in these times of COVID. We're coming, we hope, uh, we're beginning to see the light at the end of the tunnel. We're hoping that we're gonna be back on stage in the fall. Uh, but in the meantime, we've still got to try and make money. We have no box office. So please, if you can send a donation, no matter how small it is, every dollar counts. And, um, and we would deeply appreciate it. In the meantime, as I always say, take good care of yourselves, 
wash your hands, wear your masks, and only touch elbows. Bye for now.